Bishop Palais, you're a tough act to follow, but uh, I'll do my best. We will try to, I'll try to respond briefly to some of the many points that Bishop Palais made in his presentation. Um, Bishop Palais encouraged us at the beginning of his talk to begin with the end in mind. Those of you who know the book by Stephen Covey, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, will recognize that phrase. Um, I agree with that. And what is the end? As he said, is it just to fill up our churches again, or is it to fill human hearts with a greater desire for Christ? One thing I've learned is that if you want to begin with the end in mind, is that you actually have to choose the means that will lead you to the end. And often that's where we run into difficulties. We say that we want something, but then do we actually choose the actual steps, the actual means that are going to get us there? And that's not always easy to do. Sometimes we're lacking the human and financial resources in our parishes to do this kind of work. Or maybe what we're lacking is not so much money or people, but creativity, the capacity to think outside the box. Or even to face our own spiritual poverty. Do we really want to let ourselves be bothered? Do we want to be converted? We use the word conversion. We talked about at the... Um, at the colloque in Quebec City this August, we talked about le tournant missionnaire, the missionary shift. And Bishop Alain and several of the bishops rightly pointed out that the expression Pope Francis uses in the joy of the gospel is not a missionary shift, sort of a step to the left or a step to the right, like in the, uh, the time warp, but it's a transformation. It's a conversion. And conversion hurts. Conversion calls us to change. And who really wants to change? We get comfortable with our ways of doing things. They seem to work. The people come back every year. People sign up for the sacraments. Yeah, we wish maybe they would, some of them would come back to church a bit after confirmation. But this works, so we're going to keep doing it. But is it working? Bishop Alain began by telling us about that phrase at the end of the Gospel of Matthew about go and make disciples of all the nations. But before Jesus gives them that commission, that challenge, he has an encounter. So I'm going to begin with the beginning in mind, which is the beginning of the Gospel of John. John the Baptist, two, he's got two of his disciples, and he says, that one over there, he's the Lamb of God. Go follow him. And the disciples approach Jesus with a question. And I wonder how often we really ask that question ourselves. Jesus says to them, what are you looking for? And they say to him, Master, where do you live? I'm not sure if they wanted his address, his postal code, or directions, or find him on the GPS, how do you get to Jesus' house? No, where do you live? Who are you? We want to come to know you more deeply. And then Jesus says, come and see. And then we're told that they came and they saw and they stayed the whole day. It was the beginning of a relationship with Jesus. So the only point to making disciples of all the nations is if we are going to take that seriously enough to say we want people to live as disciples. We want people to have a living, breathing, life-changing relationship with Jesus, and that is what the new evangelization is all about. As was so said so well, it's not about filling our empty churches, it's about filling empty hearts, hungering hearts, thirsty hearts with the love of Christ, with a love that is greater than anything that we or they can imagine. And until we've experienced that ourselves, it's hard for us to share that. You know, we live in a society which treats almost everything as a lifestyle choice. So therefore, to choose to be a Catholic, to choose to be a Christian in the world, is a lifestyle choice, and it's one that we can make or not make, and uh, it's, it's very private. And yet we know that our faith is not private. It's personal. It's deeply personal and intimate, but it's not private. It's public, and it's communitarian. You know, we live in a world where preferring the Christian way of life to another one is no more significant than preferring wine to beer, smoked meat to poutine, 
and dare I blaspheme against La Sainte Flanelle by saying the Canadians to the Maple Leafs. But we know that faith engages us at a deeper level. Jesus asks us important questions. I didn't realize there were 200 questions in the Gospels. I'll have to go back and count them now. Bishop Allen has given me some homework now to do a little bit of work on. Go look for all the questions Jesus asks in the Gospel. But the question that he asks is that question that he asks to Peter after the resurrection. Simon, son of John, do you love me? Yes, Lord, you know all things. You know I love you. Feed my sheep. We who have heard the word of Jesus, do you love me? Feed my sheep. Are the ones who, like Peter, have experienced what it is perhaps to betray and not to know what it means or want, not want to fulfill the challenge of following him? There's many tools that we have at our disposition to foster that relationship with the living God. Um, in my own experience, one of the things that really helped me in that personal appropriation of what it means to walk with God, to experience a relationship with Jesus as good news, was the experience of the spiritual exercises. We're blessed in my neighborhood to have the Ignatian Center of Spirituality, but I know that we have Le Pellerin. We have so many places where people can go to seek spiritual support and strength. The important thing is to find whatever it is that nourishes us. And those of you who are here tonight who are involved in catechetical ministry, find out what it is that nourishes you in your journey of faith. And it's going to be different for each of us because each of us is different. But Christ wants abundant life for all of us. For some people, it is an encounter with the Word of God, praying with Scripture. Another person will experience in the celebration of the sacraments, perhaps in Eucharistic adoration, perhaps through encounters with a God who reveals himself in creation, or through very human relationships. It's amazing what experiences like falling in love, like a deep friendship, like a word or a gesture of forgiveness, how that can make concrete and real the experience of God. And that's the kind of experience that we have to be willing to not only have personally, but to share. That's what people are hungry for, not just knowledge about God, but to know the living God and to experience that love which sets us free. One of the challenges for us who, as we become, and this is true for pastors, it's true for catechetical leaders, it's true for people who work in all forms of ministry, is that sometimes those peak experiences, if they're not renewed, they can become very vague and very distant. And then we just get into the business of administering the sacraments. I hate that expression, administering the sacraments. You know, um, nothing against administration. It's a great gift for those who have it. But uh, it's not just an exercise. It's not just a thing that we do. It's we're transmitting a living, breathing relationship and a reality. And we need to find ways to make that happen. And it isn't easy necessarily. The great theologian Karl Rahner said many years ago that the Christian of tomorrow will be a mystic or he or she will not be a Christian. That our faith is no longer going to be transmitted as in a Christendom model of, well, I have faith because my grandparents had faith, or I have faith because I'm Italian, or I have faith because I'm Irish, or because I'm Filipino, or whatever culture we belong to. We have faith because we have met the one who has saved us, the one who changes our lives. And in order for that to happen, it has to happen not just personally, but it needs to happen communally as well. Bishop Alain spoke in his talk about some of the missionary practices that we need to do. How do we awaken faith in people? How do we take this seriously as a message of life and death? And for that, we need, I believe, living, breathing communities of faith. Um, last August, some of you might have been there, I know some people were, we had this colloquium in Quebec City on le tournant missionnaire à la vie chrétienne. And there was a conference I was really looking forward to, 
but I was sort of left wanting more at the end of it. One of our great theologians here in Quebec, Gilles Routier, and he was given, giving a conference that was supposed to be called a mythical parish. So, okay, great. What does a parish look like that really fosters this kind of missionary transformation? But of course, what happens with speakers is that they end up taking more time with the first two parts of their talk and never getting to the conclusion. So what happened was that we never got to hear the conclusion, which is what I was waiting to hear. Yes, we can improve our methodologies for transmitting catechetical content. Yes, we can find creative ways using audiovisual materials or using the internet or creating new family-based models that will help in the transmission of faith. But what's needed in the end is to create communities of faith that are welcoming, communities of faith that are evangelizing and in which the transmission of faith as a lived experience is happening naturally. It's happening when they come to liturgy. It happens in the preaching. It happens in the music. It happens in the way they are welcomed. It happens in the experience of wanting to belong to something bigger than my little world and wanting to believe with other people who share this conviction that Christ is at the center, that faith in Christ is a matter truly of life and death. Do we dare to build parishes that look like that? That's perhaps my dream, that our parishes will be impregnated with that desire for growth in faith for spiritual maturity, for the spirit of sharing, engagement for justice, genuine love, and that this will happen as part of what we do at every stage of life. One of the biggest mistakes we make is to think that transmission of faith happens between the ages of six and 12, uniquely, or even six to 12, dominantly. Obviously, those are important ages, but we want adults who have adult faith, who have brought their questions, who have brought their doubts, who have brought their fears, their anxieties, their need for a God of life as they confront so much in the society and so much in their own lives, which is threatening, which is painful, which reads healing. Do we, are we willing to build communities of faith that look like this? then we might begin to find out why it is that there is this magical and seemingly disastrous drop-off of people after confirmation. Where do they all go? And sometimes you have to ask yourselves, well, if what they were experiencing when they came every week was so beautiful and so wonderful, they would want to come back. How do we make people want to continue to grow and to live in the faith? Yes, as Bishop Alain said, the real drama is not our empty churches, or even our full churches if we have lots of kids and lots of families. The real drama is empty hearts. And we who are charged with this challenge of the new evangelization, who are charged with the transmission of faith to go and make disciples, have a real challenge ahead of us. But I think we're gonna do it and we're gonna do it together. I'm gonna come to that in my talk in a few moments. We were asked a question near the end of Bishop Alain's talk about some false choices that we are sometimes expected to make. Do we place God at the center or do we place the human person at the center? It's a false choice because for so many reasons. I was watching, we were on the priest retreat this past week and uh, one of the things that the Jesuit who was leading the retreat did was he showed us several films to bring alive some of the points that were, uh, were made. Those of you who know me know that using movies to illustrate points is not uh, foreign to me. He used the, the film Les Miserables with us. And those of you who know the play, who know the, that beautiful musical, know that there's a line right near the end where Jean Valjean is facing his own death. He's come to the end of his journey. And he's met on the threshold of heaven by two people, by a person who loved and forgave him when he was at his lowest point in life, the bishop who gave him his candlesticks and his silver that he had stolen, that 
Valjean had stolen so he could build a new life. A totally unexpected moment of grace and forgiveness that transformed him and changed him. And he's welcomed into heaven by him, but also by Fantine, the young woman whose child he is accepted to adopt and who he accompanied to her death. The one who had, has been loved and forgiven much, in turn loves and forgives much. And that is at the heart of what it means for us to be Catholic Christians, that we who have been loved and forgiven totally and unconditionally, we who have literally been saved from death and offered new life, that's what we want to share with others. St. John says that which we have seen with our own eyes, that which we have heard, that which we have touched and have carefully kept, the word of life, this is what we share with you. And Pope Francis, in the opening phrase of the joy of the gospel, puts it this way. He says, the joy of the gospel fills the hearts and lives of all who encounter Jesus. Those who accept his offer of salvation are set free from sin, from sorrow, from inner emptiness and loneliness. With Christ, joy is constantly born anew. And he continues, I wish to encourage all the Christian faithful to embark upon this new chapter of evangelization marked by this joy while pointing out new paths for the church's journey in years to come. Our Quebec bishops have invited us to take these words of Pope Francis very seriously. They have invited us to embrace a missionary transformation, one which aims first of all to share this joy, this blessing, this power with future generations, but also with our contemporaries, with our society that thinks it can live and do without God. But we who have met and experienced God in Jesus and through the Holy Spirit know otherwise, that our life is changed and transformed forever when we have had that encounter. Let us be generous in sharing that encounter with others and may all that we do in the work of faith formation and faith transmission be an expression of that relationship which touches human hearts, which sets us free. Thank you. I have good news for you. We are a people of good news, and Bishop Alain said that we are called not only to believe in the good news, but we must become gospel. I heard a person, wise person say many years ago that we should be joyful because we might be the only piece of good news, the only page of the gospel that that a person sees on that day. Bishop Alain had a bigger challenge before him. He needed to sort of unpack for us this idea of what a missionary conversion looks like and how we are called to embrace this task of going out to make disciples of all nations. I was just given one word to focus on, and that word is the word together, ensemble. Recently, Bishop Alain uh, quoted an expression which he told me, like most good things, he stole from somebody else. The expression is this, en français on dit tout seul on va plus vite, mais ensemble on va plus loin. Alone we go faster, but together we go farther. Now that reminded me of another expression, this one in Italian, which I learned from my good friend, Father Bertoli, who's going to be 91 years old this January and who lives with me at St. Monica's. Chi va piano, va sano, va lontano, ma non arriva mai. You go slowly and steadily, you will go far, but you might never get there. So my question is, where are we going and how are we going to get there together? And more importantly, will we ever arrive? How do we do this together? What does it mean to walk as a people of God together? It's not that easy, believe me. And part of that is, has to do with coming to terms with the simultaneous existence of unity and diversity. 
I think if we look at our own backgrounds, some of us might come from fairly monocultural backgrounds. Our mothers and fathers and grandmothers and grandfathers all came from the same place. That wasn't the case for me. I had come from a more mixed background. And um, I was thinking about that recently. My four grandparents came from four very different places. My maternal grandmother was an Irish Catholic from St. John, New Brunswick. My maternal grandfather was an English Catholic, which was a pretty small minority, from Liverpool. My paternal grandmother was half French, half English, and grew up in Quebec City. And my paternal grandfather was from Le Bas Saint Laurent, but moved to Quebec City. So we grew up in a mixed, culturally and linguistically mixed home. I grew up at a Hunsic, which was a French neighborhood, and went to French elementary school. But our culture and our language at home was typically English, and the music, the TV, the movies that we watched primarily drew from our Anglophone roots. It's not surprising when many years later I did a retreat where we were asked to discover and to discern our personal vocation, that unique name by which God calls each of us and which gives sort of shape and direction to our lives. The two words that came up for me in my personal vocation were bridge builder and reconciler. And let me tell you, whether it's been in the parishes that I've been involved in or in my work in the archdiocese or in the teaching that I do, I get ample opportunity to exercise that vocation. Unity in diversity. The birthday of the church, we are told, happened at Pentecost. And the Pentecost story, which we're all familiar with, those, especially those of you who work in uh, confirmation, know that uh, Pentecost is such a central uh, event in the life of the church, is a story of a shared proclamation of the good news inspired by the Holy Spirit. It is one message, but proclaimed by many, and most importantly, understood by all in a language and with imagery that they can understand. And that's the way it was supposed to work, at least. Everybody hearing, receiving the same message, working together, being together. In the Acts of the Apostles, you hear all these wonderful stories. The community was of one heart and one soul. They were united in the teaching of the apostles, in fellowship, in prayer, in the breaking of the bread. They shared all things in common. It was wonderful. Acts chapter 6, verse 1. Conflict broke out in the community in Jerusalem between those believers who spoke Hebrew and those who spoke Greek. Some were feeling left out. Probably someone counted the number of words they said in the liturgy and said there were 321 in Greek and only 195 in Hebrew. What are we going to do about that? So Montreal is not the first local church to experience tension over linguistic differences. It goes right back to the beginning. So we live in a diverse church. It is diverse in so many ways. And in that sense, our diocesan church is sort of a, macro, a microcosm of the universal church. The universal church, we are told, and we, we profess it in the creed every week when we get up and say the creed, is that we believe in one holy, Catholic, and apostolic church. It sounds great to be all united, to be all on the same page, to be all working together. And yet, if we stop and think about it, and we look at our concrete experience of church, whether it's the universal church or whether it's our particular parish community, we will say, yes, we are one, but we're divided. We fight a lot. We are holy. Yeah, but we're sinful too. We're Catholic. We're universal. But we're also very local, sometimes even very parochial. We are an apostolic church. We're rooted in the traditions and teachings of the apostles but we struggle with contemporary questions and we live in a contemporary world. So those marks of the church that we profess and believe in are at once what the church is, can, and should be, but it's also what we're moving towards, what we're working towards, knowing that we don't always quite make it. And that's okay. It's important though to keep those qualities, those marks, as goals towards which we tend. So what are some of the kinds of diversity that we are facing as a church? And how are we going to do this work of mission and evangelization together? We have the challenge of linguistic diversity. Now, of course, in Quebec, in Montreal, we tend to think of that primarily in terms of the English-French uh, duality. 
Most of you probably know that on any given Sunday in Montreal, Mass is celebrated in, I've lost count, is it nearly 30 different languages? We'll do a poll later, but it's close to 30 in, in any event. And as a person who moves fairly easily between several different languages, not 30, let me tell you, um, what I realize is that I need to grow in compassion and patience for those who struggle to do this, who feel left out when they can't follow what's going on. You probably notice that tonight we've offered this wonderful thing called simultaneous translation. Thank you to the translator, by the way. You're doing a great job. We're grateful for the good work that the translators do. But that's part of the reality of our diocese, is that we speak many languages, and yet we are one body. Just like at that Pentecost experience, we want people to understand as much as possible in a language and with words that are meaningful to them. Uh, in French, we distinguish between language, langue, and langage. So it's important for us not only to speak the right language in the sense of a language that people understand, but also a vocabulary that people understand. Do we adapt our language? You, those of you who work with children know that you have to adapt the words that you use in order to help children understand. Sometimes we have to do that with adults as well. We, we have this church talk that we all like to speak sometimes and we think that everybody gets it and they don't necessarily. So linguistic diversity is not only whether we speak English, French, Italian, Spanish or Tagalog, it's also about can we speak words that young children can understand, that teenagers can relate to, that um, that adults who maybe have recently arrived from another country and who are struggling to understand the customs and our ways are doing. That's a diversity that we have to contend with. And that's where we bridge from linguistic into cultural diversity. We are blessed in this diocese with magnificent expressions of different cultures. And indeed, it's bringing life to many of our parishes. The time where our parishes were either primarily French Canadian or Irish is long gone. We have so many people from so many different places. I believe when we had the Montreal Diocesan Synod nearly 20 years ago, it was une église à mille visages, a church with a thousand faces. Most of those faces are not necessarily white European anymore. They come from a great, great variety of backgrounds. I had the experience just last week of going to uh, one of our parishes, um, which 20 years ago was considered, oh, that parish is dying. Nobody goes there anymore. It's all old people. There's hardly any kids. The church is falling apart. Oh, probably in five or 10 years, it's gonna be closed. I went for their parish feast day two weeks ago. The church was packed to the gills and I have never blessed so many children as I blessed in that church. I asked the, the pastor who's from India, how many children do you have in Faith First? The probably would have been about 30, 15 years ago. Oh, 275. Now, I'll be honest, 95% of them were Filipino. But that parish is alive. That parish has life and it's bursting. So we have to celebrate that. And yet we also have to recognize that there's a loss. The loss is that maybe, what about, what do we do to reach out to the people who aren't going anymore? Uh, we were talking about that at one of our bishops meetings uh, recently. Pope Francis says we have to go out to the peripheries. And when we think of the peripheries, we think of immigrants and we think of refugees and we think naturally in those terms. But what if the existential peripheries in the church right now were our European, French, Irish, etc., people who've given up the practice of the faith, how, do, how are we gonna find ways to get close to them again and not to say, oh, it doesn't matter, our churches are full because the Filipinos and the Indians and other new groups are coming. The important thing, it's like no child left behind, we want no Catholic left behind. We wanna build parishes where everybody feels at home. And that's a challenge in terms of bridging the gaps between cultures. And that's acknowledging that different cultures pray in different ways, have a different attachment to certain kinds of devotions, um, will respond to different kinds of preaching. 
uh, want their houses and their cars blessed, uh, want their children to be blessed frequently. Um, that means that we're going to be sensitive to that. We're going to find ways of going there. But it also means fundamentally stop not to divide the world into us and them and just to think of it as an ever-expanding us. I think it was either Chesterton or Belloc, one of those English Catholics who said, the Catholic Church means here comes everybody. So that's one of the, one of the issues of diversity. What about gender diversity? We have this interesting thing where Pope Francis is saying to us that we have to make levels in the church at all reflection and decision making that there, we need to make room for what he calls the feminine genius. So congratulations to all the women who were out here. You're all geniuses. Welcome to the club. Yes, right. We're all, we're all geniuses here. So on the one hand, that's true. The fact that Pope Francis has invited a commission to study the question of the possibility of admitting women as deacons is a sign of an openness to women exercising new ministries in the church. But there also needs to be a way of making, rule, making room for the diversity of trying to get men more involved in parish life. Those of you who are involved in catechetical ministries, what percentage of your catechists are men and what percentage are women? I'm guessing 80, 90% women in a lot of parishes. Or if you're blessed with young people, I think that's, that's one of the great places where both young men and young women are getting involved. But like in, le in parish leadership roles, on parish councils, in, um, in the different liturgical ministries, um, maybe there is a challenge to get more men involved as well. Again, it's not a question of being in competition or of measuring the numbers one against the other. It's creating a church where everybody feels welcome and everybody has a gift to bring to the table. We live in a church of great vocational diversity. For a long time, you know that in the old days we talked about priests and nuns as having vocations and the rest of us just sort of made our best. I think we now recognize that people who are married, people who are single, that is, those are vocations in the church as well. Those are states of life in which we can serve God. But we're called to, in our parishes, to incarnate that kind of vocational diversity where each person has their role to play, where lay people are given their full role in the leadership and in ministries in the church, but where the particular role of the priest, the pastor, is also there and respected and honored, where consecrated life is still visible and where we talk about its importance in the life of the church, um, where we do really make a real effort to do good marriage preparation and good enrichment and support to married couples and to families. The Pope's recent document on the joy of, uh, on the joy of love about family life is a, is a reminder to us that we are called to promote and encourage families and to celebrate the unique gifts that they bring to the church. So we are called and challenged to do that and to, to make room for everyone at the table as we plan and as we try to prepare for the mission of the church ahead of us. There's generational diversity. How often have we heard it said, young people are the future of the church, and young people get tired of hearing that because they say, well, we're here. Maybe not many of us are here, but we're here. We're the present of the church. I thank the young people who've come here tonight, people who are embracing their call to live as part of the church right now. So that's one of the other things that we have to deal with, is that um, are we making efforts to welcome teenagers and young adults who are often absent from, not just from our assemblies, but also from leadership roles and from ministries. How do we take their needs seriously? How do we include them in the mission and ministry of the church and in decision making? We had a wonderful experience of that just a few weeks ago. Isabel and her team at the youth ministry office organized a mini synod. The Pope, Pope Francis thinks this is so important that after having the last synod on the role of the family, he said that the next synod of bishops in Rome next year is going to deal with youth, faith, and vocational discernment. So Pope Francis is saying that vocational diversity and generational diversity are essential to the ongoing life of the church. How are we going to make that real in our parishes? For those of you who are involved in catechetical ministries, I know a lot of you depend on the generosity of teenagers and young adults, as well as older people in that mission. So let, let's find ways of including them. Let's find ways of tapping into their creativity and understanding the world in which they live and why it's hard often for a young person to be open and honest about their faith 
in, in a world that often rejects it and makes fun of it. We also come from different spaces of ecclesial and theological diversity. I'm not going to get into all the conflicts that exist in the church sometimes in that regard, but there too we have to get beyond the us versus them mentality, the tendency that we see so much on the internet, so much in politics, of polarization, of hardened positions, of accusations, of not seeing the log in my own eye, but seeing the splinter in the other person's eye. It's a call to humility. Uh, it's, uh, it's, and, and it's a call to recognize that Christ is greater than all the divisions that threaten to separate us. I think we as a diocese are trying to find different ways of doing this together. Certainly, um, I was very delighted recently when our Archbishop appointed um, three other Episcopal vicars besides myself. There's now four of us who share in this responsibility. I have a responsibility with the English parishes. Father Alain Mongeau and Monseigneur Roger Dufresne are dividing responsibility for the French parishes and deaneries, encouraging them to work more and more in neighborhoods, more and more as communities. And um, Father Pierre Blanchard for the cultural communities. The four of us now meet together frequently we meet together on a regular basis with the Archbishop and with Bishop Alain and Bishop Tom so that we can plan together and, uh, and make sure that everybody's perspective is heard around that table when we propose new pastoral efforts. The restructuring of our deaneries is important too because they're encouraging us to break down those old esprit de clocher, parochial boundaries and think more and more in terms of how we serve the needs of one another. I was talking to one of our priests at a, at, a, at a meeting last month and who said there's a priest two blocks away from him that he's never met before because he's in a French parish and that priest is in, is in, in an English parish. No conversation, no encounter. How do we break down again those kinds of polarities and divisions? So we are challenged by diversity and yet, it is true that although alone we may go more quickly, together we will go much farther. The last example of that I'm going to show, share with you is very well named. You might have seen in the news a couple of weeks ago the Archbishop opening a new center at the uh, rectory of Notre Dame de Victoire Parish. It's called Le Pont, the bridge, very fitting. It's a, uh, they've turned, they're transforming that rectory into uh, a welcome center for refugees and migrants, people who are seeking admission to this country. Catholic Action, which is a new movement in the English sector um, for bringing together volunteers to answer needs, has been a very important partner with Alessandra and the team at the diocese who've been working at putting Le Pont together as a project. And it was a beautiful opening ceremony we had a couple of weeks ago that showed communities coming together to respond to a real need. And that need is for us to be that welcoming church, that haven where the refugee, the migrant, the person in need of a safe place can be welcomed. What we want is for all of our parishioners, all of our people, to feel that they are part of that mission, that we are called to build bridges and not walls, that we're called to let go of our prejudices, our labels of those who think or look or pray differently than we do, and celebrate that we have something to learn from each other. So as we go forward together, let's do so not tolerating diversity, but accepting and embracing it as part of God's plan for us and for our church. That although we are many and have many gifts, many different talents, many different vocations and callings, we who are many are one. We share in the one body, we share in the one bread and the one cup. We are one body in Christ and we do not stand alone. Thank you.